So um, we'll discuss a POC we completed with GuideWire team um, uh, on a use case specifically focusing on an insurance uh, modeling and risk modeling uh, of many scenarios, 64 million scenarios on a quantum computer. Um, actually, the, the, the work was primarily done on a quantum emulation, um, and that's what Blue Qubit is focused on. Um, so we are building a software platform uh, to scale up quantum emulation and make it easy for quantum um, developers uh, to test and scale their algorithms before deploying them on quantum computers. And with the GuideWire, our work focused on really doing a meaningful size problem on a quantum emulator and understanding limitations of it and, and projecting on how quantum hardware can even further uh, improve uh, those models. So we have a software managed service that supports Qiskit, Circ, and PennyLane. And uh, we focus on high performance quantum circuit executions and uh, specifically complex like workflows of hybrid uh, quantum circuits, variational circuits, quantum machine learning. Um, we are integrating tensor networks into our infrastructure to push the qubit limits uh, for specific use cases that are of interest and, uh, and have potential implications as quantum inspired solutions as well. Um, so a couple, couple of things, we, you know, there are several other quantum emulator softwares available in the market. We have benchmarks our uh, GPU optimized emulators uh, uh, against them and we see uh, improvement in a speed of compilation of quantum circuits by a factor of 100 and we can uh, scale our emulators without any, um, uh, any uh, contact or any uh, additional work by just going to our platform and changing the qubit numbers to all the way to 36 qubit emulations. We can bring up 100 uh, GPUs and run these parallelized jobs. And then this amounts to 10x improvement in cost of large scale quantum machine learning use cases. So as I said, uh, some of our um, focuses have been like hybrid uh, quantum workflows. So we are also uh, focused on uh, integrating tensor networks like Cook TensorNet, Cotangra, and other tensor network packages that are uh, have a usefulness in a specific areas of like material simulation or optimization. So we also work with quantum hardware companies, even though the near-term benefit of using Blue Qubit infrastructure and the platform relies on uh, GPU emulation and tensor networks. Uh, we're also keeping tabs and understanding deeper different quantum hardware, their pros and cons in terms of architecture, connectivity, gate performance. And uh, we work with Cura, IBM, and Continuum devices. Um, have done recently some work uh, specifically focusing on IBM job execution. After the quantum circuit was trained on a GPU, we deployed it on IBM machines and then using Q control as a middle layer to improve the performance even further. Um, so this is an example of our quantum data loader. It's a variational quantum model that our team has developed that has a new training strategy for variational quantum circuit that improves the training substantially from a limitation of 15% uh, error rate of loading a multidimensional distribution to 4%, which could be potentially interesting for uh, practical use cases. And um, so variational circuits, to give you a few uh, more details, uh, are circuits that um, have parameters, one qubit, two qubit parameters that are learnable, and, uh, and they're kind of like a neural network, but they're fundamentally quantum algorithms that are meant to run on quantum devices. Uh, but we can train them on classical devices to discover the useful circuit and then later deploy on a quantum hardware. So this is an archive uh, number for the paper we recently put out that uh, discusses in much deeper detail on this uh, new training strategy that seems to work quite well on uh, 27, we did a 27 qubit uh, case study and uh, 1,000 parameters, but the, but the infrastructure 
uh, is can push even further. We kind of topped at the 27 for the for the reasons of deploying later on IBM 27 qubit system. I think with this GPU emulators, we can push to 30 plus circuits as well. And and again, um, the the key factor is the cost reduction with a highly optimized software layer, where we see 10x reduction on training very large model of quantum circuit. Um, so here's an example of the 2D distribution that our quantum circuit has learned. And uh, again, this I think the 3D, as I said, the, the target uh, optimal uh, accuracy is 4% we achieve. With 2D distributions, we can go down to 2.3%, which is quite interesting for uh, different use cases like image loading uh, or distribution loading for financial institution or insurance. And, uh, for the POC with Guidewire team, we have used this data loading as a subroutine to explore an insurance use case where a data set is modeled and quantum circuits were used as subroutines. Um, I will pass the torch to um, Luis to discuss the insurance aspects. Um, Thanks so much. All right, let's see. I've seen, all right, this clicker works. I've seen a few not working in this talk. Um, Hi everybody, Louis Ginyard. I'm here from insurance, so you're all much greater experts than I in the quantum side. But I did want to bring a use case, um, and we've done some great work with Front and the team over at Blue Qubit um, to explore some of that. So why are we here as insurance? Um, it's not that different from finance. There are opportunities for optimization and Monte Carlo simulation exercises all over our domain. Uh, the particular one we used uh, for this uh, experiment is the reserving exercise. So what you see on, this, on these bar charts uh, over time is insurance profitability um, over a series of markets. So the dark green is the underwriting returns. That's basically premium minus expenses minus claims. And so you can see it varies year over year. Sometimes you have good years, sometimes bad years, but you're you know, running pretty lean, pretty, pretty close to zero over a long running average. The light green is your investment return. So this is what, you know, this is where insurance companies actually make their money is through investment, right? So we, we match premiums to risk pretty closely. We account for our expenses. It's what we have in our wallets that allow us to actually make money and be profitable. But we need cash on hand for when bad things happen, right? So if there's a hurricane or a wildfire, we need liquid assets to be able to pay for those events. And liquid assets don't make that much money. So we call those reserves. So one of the major exercises in an insurance shop is being able to accurately predict how much cash you need on hand for a rainy day. That's the preserving exercise. Um, the better you can predict that, um, the less money you need to keep in your wallet, right? With less certainty, you're gonna to need to hold more cash, therefore you're investing less, you're making less money, you're not as attractive to external capital providers. The more granular you can be, also the better pricing you can give. So we think, let's think wildfire in California, those in San Francisco are probably at less risk for um, having their house burned down due to wildfire than those in the mountains. Um, but you need that information, you need the ability to model accurately to get there. So in this, in this uh, map here, in the light gray, these are all wildfires that have burned in Northern California over the last five years. It's non-trivial. It's also why a lot of major insurers are pulling out of the homeowner's insurance market in California. You might have seen Gavin Newsom rapidly deploying new, um, new ways to help insurers uh, adjust premiums correctly. It's a highly regulated market. but um, it's pretty scary here. So how would we, as an insurer, look at wildfire as a risk? Well, first you need to know how likely it is, right? So what's the probability of wildfire? And what are some features that might feed into that? So how many trees are around? Did it burn last year? It's probably not gonna burn this year if it did, but if it burned 10 times in the last 50 years, you know, that's important. Um, proximity to transformers, right? That's a nod to PG&E and all their trouble in this state. Rain, rainfall, a lot of features there. Um, then given there's a wildfire, you might want to know, well, what's, what's the extent of home damage you might expect? And that's a function of what the house is made of. If you've got a defensible perimeter built around it, a bunch of features around there again. And then finally, the cost of the claim, expected cost of claim is going to be a function of materials. We all saw what happened with supply chain to auto and home and construction materials. So insurers took a big hit from that in the last few years. 
the labor market, can you get housing, medical, et cetera. All this to say there are many variables we have to consider when we start looking at, um, at these events. And so we use Monte Carlo simulation over a large a portfolio of risks to try and get a sense of like not only what's the correlated risk, but how do these features impact our bottom line to help us knowing how much cash to keep on hand to pay for them. For this specific exercise, we made a pretty simple example, but it's applicable to our industry. So R is revenue. That's what you're taking in. K is premium. That's a monthly premium you're getting from your insureds, you know, over, over all the uh, properties in your portfolio. And T is an exponentially distributed time to an accident. So here that would be wildfire, Florida or East Coast, that'd be a windstorm. And so that's, this is, um, that's your income side. Loss side, X is um, average payout, average cost of the events and why would be number of homes affected. So this would be like a very simple model to start thinking about how much loss you might expect over, a different, you know, over different time periods. So that's what we went with, with Blue Cubit, using the variational uh, you know, loading that Harant was mentioning earlier. We got those three distributions loaded up onto a quantum simulator over 41 qubits, which is pretty huge. Um, then ran that over 18 terabytes of memory with the fine folks at AWS allowing some resource for that, and then perform the multiplication and addition operations to get to that distribution uh, we showed earlier. And so here are the results. Uh, this may be a new term, so value at risk is essentially a percentile in our domain. So when I talk about reserving, an insurer would say like, I wanna reserve at the 95th percentile of loss, or in this view, the fifth percentile of revenue, which is about $2 million. Right, so that means like 19 out of 20 years, I'll be fine if I've got those reserves. The 20th, 20th year, not so fine. So with more certain, you know, if I'm less certain about this distribution, I'm gonna move to the 98th or 99th percentile or even higher to cover more risk. Um, and in this case, so we ran this with the classical Monte Carlo over 64 million samples. In my domain, that is a huge number, given that the distributions and the number that, you know, the, the the shape and the dimensionality of the distributions we actually run Monte Carlo on, Monte Carlo on 100,000 to a million samples is a reasonable expectation. Now here, again, when we ran the quantum Monte Carlo, we got about a 1.2% improvement over that fifth percentile of revenue, or 95th in loss. So in our role, that, that means an extra 1% or 1.2, you can go off and invest if this is your threshold uh, for your reserving exercise. Some others use the conditional value at risk. Just think of that as the expectation conditioning on the red in the graph. So there you see a 4% improvement. So these are huge numbers. Um, motivating more research and why we're talking with Blue Qubit in the first place. Um, that said, we'll leave this slide up uh, here for a few more statistics. And um, yeah, I think that's about it for us. So yeah, we'll open up for questions. Right, do we have any questions? One in the back. Thank you for the presentation. So you use a very simple uh, revenue model for uh, in this case. Uh, what's preventing you from like using a more realistic model? Yeah, that's a good question. I guess that goes to, comes back to um, what can you actually load up in the quantum, you know, in a quantum simulator. So let's imagine like a more realistic model for us would involve 10 to 15 different distributions. I don't know Harant, how what that would look like trying to load up on a circuit, but we use 41 qubits for this one. So I assume that's going to be a little more difficult. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I would add to it. I think more variables will make much harder to simulate. Will require more qubits. Also, I think there, there, there's room for algorithmic innovation. On you know, this, uh, this algorithms take quite a bit of ANSI like qubits as well. So if we're able to come up with a better ways to apply operations on distributions that would require less ANSI less, I think this would also enable to doing more variables. Um, and you know, there's also room for like how many uh, digit of accuracy you need per variable. I think those are interesting questions. We're planning to explore it further. Uh, but obviously, there's a limit that simulations can go to. I think 50 qubits is the is the maximal number of of the 
that you can simulate on a device um, um, on a like for a full state vector simulation. So I think that one of the the key insights is to kind of project with the actual the you know fault tolerant quantum computer how large of the if you have hundreds of uh, qubits I think you can do much more substantial more complex models. Here's another question on uh, this side. Uh, thank you much. Uh, so did you uh, run multiple number of qubits to see how this is evolving so that you can forecast how this is imp uh, how it can improve as you add more qubits uh, to or, or less to, to, to your simulation? Uh, yeah, I, I, actually great question. We haven't done it if I understand correctly in terms of like the accuracy right per degree of freedom. We haven't done it extensive tests on that, but you know we found kind of optimal number that we can fit the problem that has good enough accuracy to be meaningful, and that kind of shows up in the benchmarks against like classical Monte Carlo, like classical sample comparisons. Uh, but also a very interesting question in terms of like per distribution, how many qubits you need to capture it. I want to kind of add another interesting direction that we plan to work on is loading like m multivariant distributions. You know, like when you, your variables are not independently distributed, but come from joint distribution. This is also something we have done it for our data loader, but haven't really tested on a, on a commercial use case, and which, which is also an interesting avenue. And another question from over here. Yeah, it's a great talk. Uh, you mentioned the 50 qubit simulator limit uh, for a, a vector uh, simulator. On the slides, you talk about, what was it? 41 qubits for a tensor simulator, which were you actually using? Oh, sorry, 41 is actually uh, not a, it's a state vector simulator. Okay. So it's a state vector, you know, NVIDIA, OptiMask, TensorNet. Yeah, we haven't done it. That's actually yet another thing. We are playing with tensor network simulators. Obviously, in that case, you wouldn't have access to the full distribution. You can only measure some local observables or like specific bit string probabilities. Uh, so the use cases are much more limited, but that's another, another interesting one. We're benchmarking actively the Tensor Network simulators, which we plan to put it in our platform as a supported uh, environment. So users can go in and play with their use cases on their circuits. All right, thanks. <laughs>